Welcome to War Gaming Recon. I am your host, Jonathan J. Reinhardt. War Gaming Recon is the only member of the TSR Podcast Network to discuss historical and New England gaming. This is episode 188, Aurelian Review. So I want to welcome all of you new and longtime listeners alike to this very special episode because I have been wanting to play and review these rules for a long, long time. And I finally said, I'm going to go ahead and see if we can get a copy for us to do on the show to review. And I think I can rope someone in to do it with us. So before I go further, I just want to remind you all, we will talk about a lot of things on the show, especially with it being a review of rules. I don't expect you to remember it all because it's a lot, but you don't have to. You only have to remember one thing, and that is the link to the show notes, wargamingrecon.com slash WR188. That's wargamingrecon.com slash WR188. So let's bring in the person who was unable to say no to me because they couldn't come up with a good excuse. The one and only Mr. Adrian Benson. Adrian, how are you? I'm doing great, John. Thanks. I, I can tell in your face how excited you are. You're just beaming. This is my happy face. It is. And it comes across in your voice because listeners of the show, obviously, they don't get to see, although we do record live and we have the videos out on video land and all that kind of stuff. So people can watch as we record. But generally, they listen, you know, in the car or at work or, you know, at the gym. Probably not. I wouldn't. Gym. Yeah, I wouldn't watch live. No, not you, not your kind of thing. No, it, it's yeah, two guys on, talking to each other. Yeah, no, I wouldn't watch that live. I would listen to it, but watch it, no. So, so there is a benefit actually for people who choose to watch live, or even if you just want to later on watch the video. But if you watch live, you can actually leave comments and interact with us, so we can see those mm. in the yeah, feed. Yeah, that's true. And they can be like, well, we got a question from the audience over here. So, hello, sir, you wanted to know about blah, blah, blah. And, you, and the person's like, blah, 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 blah. And then they get on the air, which is kind of right. cool. That is true. I did not so, consider that. but yeah, I, I did not think he did. But that's that's why I'm here. Okay. It's one of my purposes. <laughs> All right. That's one. I'll write that one down. <laughs> yeah, mark it down on your very <laughs> short list. <laughs> so we are talking about a set of rules, which you and I, we talked about the other day. And we said that uh, I honestly wasn't sure how you pronounced it. Aurelian? It, do you think I'm getting it right? I'm butchering it. Okay. I think you're getting it right. I'm certainly not the right person to ask. But yeah, I think I think that's right. Because I, I, I'm going to say it differently every single time I, I say it. I know I am. So I'm probably going to just be like, the set of rules or the thing Mr. Mustafa wrote yeah. is blah, blah, blah. Because... It's it's one word, not a lot of letters, right? It shouldn't yeah. be hard to pronounce. And yet my addled mind is like, how do you say this word? It's like gobbledygook to me. And I don't know why. I think it's Aurelian, but I don't know. We'll go with that. So let's discuss. This is a set of rules that is so different for both of us, right? Completely unusual from anything we would have played otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, I'm, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say that I think part of it even stems from the format that it comes in. But w what were you going to remark? Well, I was just going to say that Ancients to begin with isn't one of my primary areas of interest. Um, I'm trying to think of all the Ancients games I've played, and there just aren't that many. The only set of Ancients rules I own that we've actually never played is um, Hail Caesar. That's not true. Okay, we played one time at a... Uh, uh, Hobby Bunker Game Day, I think. That's I right. I think we played twice. Actually, I think you played twice. I think I've played once. No, I've only played once. That was the only time. Okay, then we, we played once, and we both own the set of rules. Yeah. We liked it. But, um, I did like it, yeah. But it's, the thing, it's like I enjoy Ancients gaming, but um, in order for us to play it regularly, we're going to have to paint armies, and obviously you're not going to do that. And with all the other projects we have going on, I'm not going to have time to do it. And I'm not really inspired to paint ancients anyway. So it's kind of, you know, yes, I would like to play, but I'm not, it, yeah, it's not going to happen probably. So, well, and, and that actually brings us back to some of the things about Aurelian that I think make it different enough from anything we've ever tackled. So, Aurelian, in case people don't know, 
It's designed by Mr. Sam Mustafa, part of his Honor Series of War Games. He has a bunch of them out there. Longstreet and Maurice, and his new one is Rommel, and I'm forgetting one of them. Uh, what's the other one? Bluger. There we go. And, and that's all of them, I, I, I believe, from the Honor Series. A um, long time ago, there was one called, uh, what was that one called? LaSalle, I think. Oh, right, right. And, and he has another one that I honestly, I don't, I don't think it's part of the honor series, but it's another set of rules he's done. It's a sci-fi one called yeah. Free Jumper. Yeah, it was on the site the other night, actually, and that one kind of caught my eye because that's it very different. Yeah, very different from anything we do. But yeah, it looks cool. That's on my list of things for us to perhaps say about reviewing as time moves yeah. forward. It, this only costs $29. It's only available in PDF. There's no hardcover. There's no soft cover of it. You can't just go to your local game store and buy the book. You get to buy the PDF from Sam. It comes in two formats. You get color, and that's what people who are watching the video see because I have the color version. Um, you get both of them, actually, but it comes in color. You get nice full-color pictures and everything, or you can get printer-friendly, which is black and white or grayscale. The rules include print-and-play action cards, which are anyone who's ever played a game by Mr. Mustafa know you have a bunch of cards because they're card-driven games, even though they're miniatures games. But you'll have like a hand, kind of like you're playing poker or magic or anything. And you use those for different actions and um, activities throughout your turn and throughout the game. So you can either get them as part of the rules. They're included in there, and along with the armies. So you can get the, he calls them unit tiles, but you get basically your armies there. Or you can purchase them online from Wargame Vault. So... If you get them on Wargame Vault, they come on like nice poker size cards, the standard size cards, fully printed. They're kind of glossy. They look good. And the same with the action cards. So you can get them all on there, and they range anywhere in price from $18 to $20 per deck, varying number of cards for the unit tiles and everything. And it's set in the 3rd century AD. And I think that's good enough of an overview for people, I would hope. Yeah. Um, do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about the gameplay or the way the turn goes and uh, things of that sort so people can kind of get an idea? Of... Um, I can. I mean, you've got the uh, – oh, you've got it right there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's pretty similar to the other Honor Series games that I've played, which has been uh, – well, ones I've played recently have been Longstreet and uh, Maurice. Um, they all work fairly similarly. The mechanics – uh, particularly for Aurelion, are really pretty pretty simple. There's, there, it's not hard to get your head around. And I don't know if he designed it specifically to be like a, uh, what would you say, an introductory level game or an easy game for people to get into, like people who haven't gamed before or if you've got uh, friends or whatever that you want to introduce to the hobby. Um, I don't know if he had that in mind when he designed it, but it would be a good game for that because, like I say, the mechanics are really quite simple. There's not a whole lot of... Uh, minutia and detail I think I would in there call it accessible okay that's good yeah access it definitely is it's easy to pick up um because I, I think if you say simple it implies that there's not much depth to it and i actually think yeah okay, first, first of all, we've only played a couple games which is maybe we not have. the fairest way or the best way to go about doing a review but i feel like we actually got quite a good feel for the game based on that and along with prior experience to Sam's games, and along with just prior wargaming experience. I mean, we've been doing this a long time, so it's yeah. not like we're new to how you review or how you play a game or whatever. Uh, I, I can tell you, um, just to stop you for a moment, but I can tell you that the game is partly a response to an editorial or a column he wrote many years, well, it feels like many years ago, it was probably half a dozen years ago, for Wargame Soldiers and Strategy, in which he was lamenting how people don't paint miniatures anymore. And he has his regular gaming group. And even them, people who've been gaming for a long, long time, they're like, I don't have time. I don't want to paint miniatures. I don't want to buy minis. And how are you going to get them to play? And how are you going to get newcomers or younger group of people to come in and play when they don't have the time or desire to do such a thing? And so this and Free Jumper as well, I believe, were both kind of intended. And Sam can correct me if I'm wrong because he's going to be coming on the show in another episode of four or five down the road, I think. Um, but I think was, this was kind of done as a way to get people into this sort of stuff who might not have played Ancients or might not be into these sorts of war games necessarily and to make it 
easier for them to do so so they don't have that up high cost in the beginning where you got to buy like thousands of dollars worth of rules and minis and paints and all this kind of stuff that you can get this and just dive in yeah yeah and i mean that is definitely a problem i mean there are people who really enjoy the the modeling and painting aspects of the hobby i'm not one of them um but i mean it's a problem even in our gaming group we've got guys who god how long we've been playing with them 10 years it's been that long uh, uh but it's longer but still have armies for games that we put well we used to play regularly that aren't completely painted yet so it's yeah it is kind of a uh, and i mean for a lot of people that doesn't bother them having unpainted minis and stuff on the table i'm not a zealot about it but i definitely prefer everything to be painted i mean i personally won't put anything on the table that's not painted so but that's just me um but yeah, anyway, it is a, it is a problem both in terms of time and people getting the, the painting done, and like like you had mentioned, the expense. It can be not prohibitive, probably, but you can spend a lot of money on it. So, but yeah, this is a good response to that because for the twenty nine dollars you pay for the rules, you get everything you need. Now you got to print it all out and cut it out and kind of assemble it yourself. But you you pay the $30. It's almost like buying a board game. You pay $30 and everything you need to play the game is included, which is great. So, well, as you had said, kind of at the start, you had mentioned that ancient's not really your thing. And part of the problem is having to collect and paint and um, build another army and the time for that. The, if we had to do that for the set of rules, we wouldn't have been reviewing them. And nah. I, I got to say, that's part of the reason why I was like, Oh, why don't we do, I, I I make an editorial decision. I, I mean, there's a bunch of us here on the show and we all talk and communicate about everything uh, just to give people a little glimpse behind the curtain. But I, I made an editorial, editorial even decision uh, that I try to shy away from reviewing rules of games where we don't have existing collections of stuff, whether it's terrain or miniatures or whatever, just because it's not fair to the game designer or the company who created them knowing that it's going to take a, a very, very long time for us to ever get around to it. Yeah, and it will. So like this, I knew that wouldn't be a concern because we could buy the unit tiles, the, the armies basically, uh, yeah. pretty cheaply for nicely made stuff. Yep. Or um, if we didn't want to spend the money, and I mean, we did because we wanted to see like what everything was really like to give a more comprehensive look at it. Um, but like you said, you could just print it out and, and cut it out, make as many copies as you need for the game, a, and then you get your army right there and it's just it's time and paper and ink yeah yep a little bit of pain in your hand because you know you gotta cut it all out but well yeah go to steep go to staples and spend 15 bucks or whatever on a uh one of those paper cutters with a lever and that would make things a lot easier but but i mean even so you're saving time and everything else from the cost oh, yeah. and buying minis and painting them and stuff and yeah, i mean you can still do that with this that's <clears throat> completely allowed in the rules that there's actual coverage for that and how to handle it. And you can even do it where someone has painted minis and you have the print and play stuff. You can even mix it in your own side so that you have a combination of minis and printed play stuff, as long as they're the same base width. Uh, that's really all that matters. Um, yeah. do, do you want to take us through what the sequence of play is, you know, for a single turn? Uh, yeah, you can. I mean, you had it up there before, but the sequence of play is uh, so John mentioned it before, but the the game is driven on car, off of uh, cards. So it's like each player has a deck of cards, and from that deck of cards, you depend uh, it depends on the particular mode of the game you're playing. But you you have in your hand seven cards, and these cards have various um, uses. But once they can uh, control your movement they control combat um and you took the reference sheet away so now i don't remember the sequence of play but that's cool um <laughs> so the first phase of the, the first phase of any turn is what's called the event phase and so some of the cards that you'll have in your hand can be played as okay yeah like that one there it can be played as an event and so the turn sequence is you go i go so the active player takes all of his performs all of his actions to include moving shooting combat and then the when he's completed then the other player does the same thing 
does shooting, movement, combat, etc., and that constitutes one turn. So, in general, while the active player is is performing his actions, the passive player uh, isn't able to do anything. But the cards, like the one John's holding up right now, there are some cards in the deck that you'll have that can act as an interrupt for certain phases. Um, and the phases are rally phase, movement phase, shooting phase, and uh, combat phase. And there are different interrupts for the different phases that can greatly hinder the opponent's ability to do what he may want to do. Um, for example, there's there's one, I don't know if you can find it real quick, but it doesn't matter, but there's a, there's a movement interrupt that you can play that regardless of how many units the active player wants to move, um, you can limit the number of, of units he, that he actually can move. Or maybe he has one particular key unit that he wants to move, that he wants to charge with. Um, yeah, there you go. So the, you can really use these interrupt cards to disrupt um, your, opponent's, your opponent's plans. And part of the game, and it's not just really, and I think all the Honor Series games operate this way, but skillful use of the cards and knowing what they do and when to play them is uh, going to be one of your keys to victory in Aurelian and indeed in any Honor Series game. And it's kind of a neat, uh, it's kind of a neat process. I, I went into the, uh, the Honor Series games being sort of opposed to the card-driven nature of them because it's, it seems like every game nowadays, whether it's a board game or whatever kind of game, they're all card-driven. Everybody has to have a deck of freaking cards, even board games. Um, like some of the lock and load series, they've all everything is card driven. I don't really love it, but with the honor series, um, the way the cards work, it, it really does a good job of simulating um, what would you call it? command friction, I guess. Wherein, particularly in in like the ancient world where communication was, you know, they didn't have radios and whatnot to communicate orders across the battlefield the cards that you have in your hand sort of limits what you can do. So in a lot of cases, you're not going to be able to do everything you want to do. You're not going to be able to move all of your troops on the board, for example. Um, you can play these cards. Can you hold that back up, John? You can play these cards in, in the movement phase. And that number that you see in the upper, in the upper corner there in the laurel wreath, that indicates how many of your units you can actually move during the uh, during the movement phase. This particular card is the best one you'll see in the in the game, and it will allow you to move six of your units. Most of them are only going to let you move two, maybe three units. So it can be I, difficult to. I uh, should correct you though, because uh, you and I, when we played, we kept on referring to them as units. Uh, it actually is forces because you can have more than one unit. A unit would be. For Romans, like you can one experienced cohort, but you could have, depending on how things are set up, as long as they adhere to the rules, you could have two of them uh, together, and this would be one force. So that six that you used from in the laurel wreath to allow movements, instead of each one of these units counting as one of those two sixes, so these two would be two of the six. If they're a force, they're actually only one of the six. So you yeah. could have a force of your entire army, depending on what your army is composed of, because there are certain criteria to what can be in a force, as we found out last time we played. Yeah, yeah, we were doing it wrong, a little bit wrong the first time, but that's all right, learning experience. But yeah, that's true. I mean, if each individual unit, if the individual units are within a base width of each other, if they're of the same unit type and they're in the same uh, affecting terrain, then that counts as a force. So you could have like four units, five units, if all those five units are in the same, say they're in, they're all in open terrain, they're all massed infantry, they're all within a base width of each other, then they can move as one force or one unit. So depending on how you have your army arranged, and that's another thing that you would you'll get skilled with is how to how to organize your troops to maximize their potential for movement. Um, yeah, it's, it's not as bad as it sounds. It's not like you're going to have 20 or 30 units out on the table and, oh my God, you're only going to be able to move one stand of troops or one unit tile a turn. It's it's not that way. But it still does limit you on what you can do. Um, do you think we should talk about what the icons mean on the cards? Because I know for me as a new player, it was kind of confusing 
Uh, I, I don't know if this delves into uh, a negative, which I know we're doing as a separate section or, or not, but um, about the icons, both on oh, um, uh, the, the action cards that you play has a variety yeah. of icons, and then also your unit tiles have uh, different icons as well. Uh, yeah, we can. I mean, we should probably talk a little bit more about the mechanics before we dig into that. But uh, yeah, sure. I mean, we can. So the um, getting back to the sequence of play, which I totally got off track on. So the uh, the first thing in the phasing player will do, he has to decide if he's going to play one of the event cards that we talked about. And normally the event card is going to be something that's going to uh, going to benefit him. So it'll be, um, he may have an event card that allows all of his units to move an extra base width for that turn, for example. So he plays his event card. And then the next phase would be the rally phase. Um, as your troops uh, perform combat and potentially as they move around the board, they acquire disruption points, anywhere from one to four disruption points that you, the game provides counters to keep track of. Um, each unit has a maximum of four disruption points. <coughs> Excuse me. And then once you get to the fifth, the fifth disruption point, that unit is considered destroyed or dispersed or whatever, and it's removed from the game. So one thing you may want to do is to rally your troops to get these disruption points off. So that's what the rally phase is for. In order to rally your troops, you have to play a card from your hand to do that. But the downside to doing that is that any card that you play to rally troops is removed from the game permanently. And that's kind of a big deal because one of the ways that the game can end is that you run out of cards to play. If you run out of uh, action cards that you, that you can play to perform actions with your troops, the game's over and you lost. So after the rally phase comes shooting. So if you have missile troops, within there are two kinds of missile troops. There are light and what are called mast, light archers and mast archers. And these can encompass, I mean, the unit types are generic, but they would encompass any kind of uh, archer that you could think of in the time period, anywhere from, you know, guys with javelins and slings to, uh, okay, yeah, there's the mast archer. There you go. And they have different abilities, light archers. Okay, these guys are light. Can shoot up to a range of, I think it's four base widths. And then the masked archers have a little bit of an advantage in that they can shoot five base widths or six base widths. Uh, light troops are more mobile, obviously, than the masked guys. But shooting in the game, and I assume in, in ancient combat in general, like I said before, I'm no expert. But shooting is more of a, uh, a harassment kind of a thing than anything else. Uh, the best you're the best you're going to do with a uh, with an archery attack is put one disruption point on a unit. Uh, but that can be valuable. I mean, if you have a unit that is in archery range and he's sitting on four disruption points, and you put another another point of disruption on it, then it's it's broken. It it has to leave the game. Um, and the thing with the uh, with the archery is it's it's easy to do damage to a unit. It's almost a guaranteed disruption point. Um, so when you perform combat in the game, say you have two archer units that want to shoot at two different enemy units, then for each archer that you have that wants to shoot, again, we get back to the cards and you have to play a card from your hand. Can you hold one of the action cards up, John? Okay, with the laurel value in the top corner of the card there, this one is a one. And when you're shooting, what you have to do, and this is something we should have pointed out right from the beginning, there's no dice rolling in this game. Everything is determined by the cards. Combat results, it's all determined by the cards. There's very little, theoretically, there's no dice rolling in the game. You're supposed to flip a coin called an Aureus, but we just rolled a, uh, we just rolled a D2 for random outcomes. But uh, in any event, when you're shooting, what you have to do is play a card with that, number that's called a laurel value that exceeds the armor of your target. Can you hold up a, yeah, there we go. Okay. So this, this unit here in the lower corner, you can see that's too close. There you go. You see the shield, the number of shields equals the unit's armor value. So in order to damage that unit, you know, it has an armor value of one. You have to play a card with a laurel value that is bigger than one. 
and that's all there is to it. If you do that and you defeat the, uh, the shield value, the armor value of the target, you've done damage to it and it takes a, uh, it takes a disruption point. But there's a downside. And this is one that I think we both learned quickly the first game we played that for shooting and combat, whenever you are playing a card for an attack uh, is how I kind of just like to think of it. And, and as you said, Adrian, the attack being you're using the laurel value on the card, you discard the single card that has the highest laurel value on your side. So if you're playing this one and it's a one and that's your highest and I'm playing one with the six, and that's my highest, they're not only discounted, they're removed from game. Exactly. Which then triggers you to continue on the track towards your end game, which, depending on the scenario, end game is when you run out of cards in your deck. So right. you have your 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 actual your, your deck you draw from, uh, which is composed of the common cards and the ones that give more flavor for your actual army, shuffled together so you don't know what you're getting. And then you have ones that are... Uh, discarded that you use and they, they just go into the separate discard pile which will then get reshuffled into your main deck and then you have the ones that you remove from a game and when you have no more in a discard pile to shuffle through and they're all in your remove from game pile you lose right so, so if you're just doing a lot of shooting yeah you're guaranteeing yourself to cause a disruption which is great kind of think of it as um giving a, a wound in a sense to the the enemy unit and eventually the the unit breaks because you've given them too many casualties yeah you can do that but it's really expensive um and you know it's guaranteed of course so that's great but you're going to keep on losing these cards which you then need to do everything else as you had um, mentioned earlier because you need them to play your as an actual like event card i mean that's if it has an e on it it's the event card you need it because you might want to rally and use the flag icons on it um to for uh, how many disruptions you're going to rally off or casualties you're going to rally off. So you need to do that for that. And then you also need to use them both for your shooting and for your actual combat. And yeah. uh, I mean, as I think we can all figure out if all you do is shooting, you're never going to win, but you need to do some kind of variation. So you integrate both your shooting and your hand-to-hand -hand combat. And as you had said earlier, you can't do it all in that. Was no, you can't. I That's, yeah. I mean, it's great because like the first game I was like, I'm going to attack and I'm going to be super aggressive, which is not how I play. But I thought Romans should attack because that just that seems like a great thing that they should do because they're armored and I was playing against you with your German barbarians. And it's like, what the heck are you going to do? Like you had more troops than I did. But I was like, I'm Rome. So Rome is going to just kick butt and I should just attack as a wall. So I'm doing this and that. Next thing I know, my pile is like this thick of cards that was removed from game. Yeah. And I was worried about triggering Endgame for me. And but luckily, you were kind of doing the same thing. So that first game, we had a situation where it was like we're both really low, but who's going to go out first? And then the second game, I, I swapped it around. I was like, well, I'm Rome. I'm going to make you come to me because you're a barbarian and I'm civilized. So you're going to come to me thinking, okay, this is going to conserve my card so that when you get within range, then I'll do like a volley of shooting to yeah. soften you up a little bit and then charge into you with my, you know, my cohorts, whether they're experienced or veterans or whatever, so that I could then do enough to maybe break a unit or two. Yeah. And no matter how you're broken, whether it's from your, your shooting mechanic or whether it's from your uh, hand to hand mechanic, it, it can be quite devastating it, because it brings us back to that remove from game situation. So the unit tiles have right underneath the icon of their, um, what they're supposed to be, a number of cards, or silhouettes almost. Yeah. And when that unit is removed from game, when it's dis destroyed, defeated, whatever you want to call it, uh, when it its disruption counter goes all the way to four and then past it because it's gone, not only does that card go out, but then you lose however many silhouettes from your hand. So that one's a four. So you lose four from your hand or you draw from the, uh, without knowing what they are, you draw from the top of your pile and just put them right into the remove from game thing so yeah. you take a few casualties and like you're in serious trouble because then you really can't do all the other things not that you really could before but you could do enough to kind of give you a feel of like you have to focus which i i love about this game yeah that like i okay so i i we've talked about how we both love black powder and hail caesar is basically black powder um, but that whole kind of core concept and one of the things i love about it is, is 
an exact opposite of this game. And yet I love them both, but for different reasons. So in Black Powder and Slash Hail Caesar, depending on what you roll, in theory, you could make everything on your side of the table, yeah. move, shoot, attack, whatever. Everything could do everything and end up all over the table. This, you can't. And I love that it really restrains you to, to think more tactically to say, okay, I need to accomplish whatever my goal is for the scenario, or you could do, this is, I think, ideal for campaign play, which we haven't done, but I want us to do. Um, but I need to conserve my force. I need to accomplish whatever. So what do I really need to do? Do I want to just move troops and models or, or unit tiles around because it's fun, which I think like a game of like bolt action, or a black powder, you're going to do because you're like, why not? There's no negative to it. I'm going to roll the dice. I'm going to move the unit or whatever just because it gives me something to do. It's fun. I like to roll dice. I like to move models. I like to move whatever. But with this, you have to think twice. And it causes you to actually, I think, behave more like a unit commander, like an army general would. You're not just going to be like, so let's move that division of tanks over there onto the ridge because I just, I feel like it, right? No one's going to do that. And they wouldn't have done that here. I mean, maybe if you're just you're stupid or something, I guess you're like, move the cavalry over there because they look bored and I'm curious and I'm going to make my horse a senator. I mean, I, I don't know. But otherwise, you're going to be like, we need to for the river and get to the town and sack it. And, and so you focus on how to do that. And that's where you're going to put most of your emphasis. So you're not just going to be moving stuff around and shooting it willy nilly. And I like that it forces you to do that. It constrains you so that you really have to think, what do I need to do as opposed to what do I want to do? Yeah, it definitely forces you to make decisions, sometimes hard decisions. I mean, it, like you said, you can't shoot willy-nilly because every time you do that, you're going to lose one card. So if you've only got one archer who can take a shot, it's not worth a card just to put a disruption point on a guy. If all your archers can shoot at somebody, that, that's a different story. But if you've got one unit, he's going to put, unless it's going to break a unit, um, it's really not worth taking the shot. Now, I didn't adhere to that rule a couple of times that we played, but in oh, hindsight, yeah, in hindsight, it's obvious, you know. Um, and there are other situations like that, but it, it it definitely forces you to make decisions that other games don't necessarily force you to make. Because running out of cards is going to end the game, and you're going to lose. It happens faster than you think. It does actually, yeah. Um, Especially if you only have maybe not all the cards you're supposed to have. Yeah, like if, for example, the podcast host, you know, perhaps cheated. And hey, did, and cheating didn't give you... implies that such a thing, hypothetically speaking, that such a thing would have been intentional. If the podcast host cheated and didn't give you all the action cards that you were supposed to have, guaranteeing that your German barbarians would run out of cards before his Roman imperial troops... Yeah, that makes the game hard to play. Well, hy the hypothetical podcast host would have to say that he is Rome and Romans do not, you know, apologize to barbarians because Romans and on are top civilized of that, and, and not barbarians. And on top of that, the Romans have a cheat card anyway that adds them, lets them... Oh, oh yeah. So uh, let's talk about the cards a little because, I mean, we the core mechanic that you covered for shooting is the same exact mechanic for combat except uh yeah pretty much um, i mean it's not an auto win each side no, definitely not throws the card down and then you reveal and you add it to uh what's it called your elon which is your the number swords, of swords yeah your attacking value um each one counts as a one you add your number your laurel um, value laurel value and then you subtract any disruptions that you might have and, well you subtract one if you have any disruptions if you have any no. sorry uh, and then if you've attacked on a flank, like so, yep. you the, um, you double. You, yeah, the attacker yeah. doubles. Yeah, Which so, is really nice. Yeah, if um, you can hit somebody in the flank, that, that's as close as you can get in the game to a guaranteed win. And then, Although we had a couple of circumstances where it wasn't. So I know, I was shocked because I've yeah. been the one who's been getting those flank attacks, which is very unusual for me. And a few times you were okay. And then some of the cards, I mean, as barbarians, you guys like to run away because you're afraid of Rome. And you have, I'm trying to find here, you have some cavalry actually that allows you to flee from combat uh, if you lose. And um, they have 
you'll have either one or two uh, green arrows so that if you're like, oh, I'm going to lose, I get to get out of dodge. Yeah. And so then you kind of retreat back. What is it, up to two base width, something like that? Uh, it depends. For light cavalry, uh, yeah, it's – or. Yeah, like cavalry is two base widths. And the triangles are, if you have one triangle, you can retreat only from infantry. Two triangles, you can retreat from anybody. But it's a huge advantage because if you get hit in combat, the potential is there to be destroyed in that melee combat. So say you take five disruptions, you lose a combat by a uh, by five points. Your unit is destroyed. But if you have, if it's a light unit with the ability to evade, and then you successfully evade, um or escape rather they call it instead of taking those five disruption points you just basically retreat and take only one disruption regardless of how many you lost the combat by so yeah that, that and that came in handy a couple of times and i mean it's bad enough to lose a unit but then it goes back to losing the cards too so the like card. you're like cavalry i think even the germans have um like every have one card that you lose whereas you're you're heavy um for Roman's armored cavalry, you lose three cards. So it, it would be terrible to lose this unit, right? Because this unit is great. You get five attack, two shields, or defense against shooting. Uh, they're masked, they're beefy, and all that kind of stuff. And they move four, I'm on the wrong side, and, and everything. But if they die, I mean, that yeah. hurts a lot. Yeah. Yep. And it just, it, it's hard. Um, but some of the action cards. And this is one of the things that I love, and you kind of alluded to earlier in the episode. They add some flavor. So, for example, with the Romans, because Romans are awesome, um, we all know about Testudo. It's in everything, every movie you've ever seen, any Hollywood Roman uh, has been like, let's Testudo because, and whether or not they did it all the time, I, I cannot tell you. But, like, because. And how are you going to do that in this game? Or are you just going to give them a beefier defense against shooting and that presumes they're always going to test tuto. So if you don't know what test tuto is, it's tortoise. They interlink. I, I just realized people might not know what yeah. it is, even though it's pretty universal. Um, they interlink the shields. So covers in front covers above and they move forward. So they're a fort on foot. And in, in the game, you're like, well, how can you do that? And Sam did it in a genius thing, actually. So he has this card here, test tuto which is one of the interrupts that you had mentioned. And if you play it as an interrupt, it's really cool. So it says all Roman cohorts that are fired upon in their turn, treat their armor values as too higher than they actually are. So it does not make them invincible, which is something that many games do for Romans. Yeah. They're like testudo because they're a tank and you're not going to hurt them with your little wooden shafts of arrows. This says we're really good at not getting shot by your flaming arrows, but, you might still get us. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can still do stuff. So it doesn't completely negate everything. And, and you were alluding to a card earlier about um, the removed from play cards, which is really, uh, I'm, and is that not in, I, I thought that was in there. So that might be in the common, because I can't. No, that's, that's got to be in the Roman deck. Well, of course, I didn't have all the common cards I was supposed to have, so I guess I don't know that for sure. No, but I mean, I'm flipping through as we are talking because we are professionals here. And Indeed. I tell you, I cannot, I can't see it. So either I get it in the wrong spot, which I don't think I do, or it is in the other uh, area because they have all sorts of other things in here. And um, But there's this card. Since I can't find it, we'll just not talk about it, but we'll actually tell you what it is. There's a card that says, um, whether it's Roman ones or, or someone else, I don't know. But there's a card that says, uh, you play it, and it's a remove from game card, which cards that have um, the garbage can on it, you remove them from game when you play them. Um, when you play them as an event or an interrupt. Yeah, not as um, for movement or, or rallying or that kind of stuff. Um, but it says that you take six cards uh in, you shuffle your remove from game pile oh uh, so you go shuffle 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 and then you take six cards without seeing them from the top face down and you add them into your um discard pile and then they get you know reshuffled back into your deck eventually 
Uh, so basically, it gave you six cards back, six yeah. points of life back in the game, so that you don't have to worry about like, oh, I'm six cards out. What am I gonna do? Yeah, uh, it, I mean, that's it, that's huge. It is, and I, I, I think he did a really good thing by balancing it by saying, yeah, I'm gonna put the trash can icon on it, so that you're removing it from game, and the chances of you getting it are slim, and you still have to be able to play it as. I think it's an event card or something like that. So you should have to be able to play it when you're the active player in your event phase and all of that. Um, but like, it makes a difference and I can't understate that enough. Yeah. Yeah. If like the first game we played was very close. It, I mean, at the end of the game, I ended up losing because I ran out of cards first, but we both had what, maybe four or five cards toward the end of the game in our hand. It is uh, uh a common card shuffle the pile of removed cards and place it face down okay. then draw the top six cards and return them to the game by placing them in your discard pile event card worth two rally points five laurel which is pretty great yeah and trash can so it's like how are you going to use this because this has so many potentially really good uses but it's a card everyone gets so that's kind of nice it adds a little bit of flavor but it's not i mean as Everyone gets the card if the podcast host. But like, it, it's not like only Romans get it or only barbarians get it. Theoretical doesn't cheat. It's in your common. Give you the card. I think he calls it the common deck of action tile. Yeah, because uh, action cards. Yeah, everybody's supposed to have the same set of cards, which you know. Well, not, not the same. Good. You get every because everyone gets the common deck, which you print out or you buy, and right. they get and the, therefore faction deck and then you yeah. shuffle it together and you don't know what you're going to get so you do have some sort of basic functions yeah i understand that actions, but everyone's common it, deck so. everybody's common deck is supposed to be the same ours yeah. wasn't no of course not i because can't overstate that enough accidents but, happen is what it is but like any you know big boys and girls we move forward and we learn from our mistakes so that next time we fix it and it doesn't happen again and ideally when you're doing this i would honestly this is a piece of advice. Don't do what I did and don't rush to print out a bunch of common decks and cut them up for like three. I I did it. I wanted three of them because I had two yeah. for one for you and one for me. And then a buddy and co-host of ours was potentially going to be coming and joining us. And I was like, I need another set. So I printed two more because I was like, this way we have four because that's all the factions. And I did it and I put them in the baggie and they inter intermingled, and so they came out, and I did not have a list, because as far as I can tell, there's no list of what cards compose the deck. And so it was just like, I think this is what it is. Don't do that. Don't put them all together. If you're going to cut them and print them out or whatever, do one at a time, and bundle them together, and keep them separate from everything else, because otherwise you end up with the mistake that I had made, and yeah. that's not what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, why don't we talk about some of the things that we like about Aurelian? Um, I think we've pretty much already hit all the things we like about it, or a lot of the things we like about it. My favorite thing about the game, and it's the same for all, like I said, all the uh, Honor series is, and this is not a thing for me to say because I hate cards, mm -hmm. but I love the way the cards simulate, do a good job of simulating command friction, and you emphasizes not emphasizes, but demonstrates your inability to do everything that you may want to do with your army on the table. Uh, I mean, this is a persistent problem with a lot of games. Um, and a lot of gamers don't like games that actually do a good job of simulating that because they want to be able to do everything that they want to do with their army. They want to, because, you know, you got this godlike view as the gamer. and Well, they used to play like 40K wanna... or Flames of War or things like that. And uh, those games yeah, let you do well, anything you can ever imagine, basically. Yeah, I mean, most games are like that, though. Um, mm. and people don't like not being able to play with their toys, basically, which I understand. But, uh, yeah, that that's probably my favorite aspect of this game in general in the series, or this game in particular in the series in general, is, uh, is the way the cards do a good job of it. But he, the way he handles cards, too, is different. A, a lot of the games that incorporate card play, um, a lot of the cards end up kind of like being... I don't know, like superpowers, like you pick up a power pill in Mario Brothers or something like that. I can't stand that. But these cards, the, the way he does the cards, it's not like that. So, no, the, yeah. I, I tell you, when uh, we first started talking about doing this, 
and you were rather concerned uh, about it being card driven and some of the other things. And our, our buddy uh, Alex was like, it's no minis. And like, I know that turned him off right away. And I said, well, you can play with minis, but we probably won't because we're not gonna have time to do that. But like you could. And he was like, uh, but I think the fact for me that you don't need minis, that everything is self-contained and it's only $29 American yeah. is a huge pro because you're not going to find that kind of value anywhere else. So not only is it affordable, not only is it, I think, generally really well written and plays well and interesting, but even if it wasn't, and I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm saying it is, even if it wasn't, I mean, you get all this stuff in it. So yeah, you're going to do a little bit of work so you can print them out and cut them and stuff. But if you don't mind spending a little bit of money, um, you just buy the decks, whether it's the unit tiles for your armies yeah. and or whether it's the action cards. So they're going to last longer, they're nicer, they feel better in your hand. So some people like to shuffle. I mean, this is a sound you really want to hear on a podcast. <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. Joshua was going to be like, John, what did you do? I had to edit that. Yeah, you're terrible. <laughs> he's probably what he's going to be thinking. But like, you, you get everything in this. So this is the kind of thing, I think, in general, with tabletop gaming, there's such a high cost to get into it. Whether you're doing sci-fi, you're doing fantasy, you're doing pulp, even if you're doing board games, uh, but definitely with historicals, I think there's really that high cost in. So I think that's a huge barrier for people, regardless of age, but specifically for younger people. Yeah. And there's a huge push nowadays for trying to um, get younger blood into the hobby because there's, I'm going to call it now a perceived notion that the hobby is getting too gray and that eventually it'll die out and i really have to say i don't think that's true Uh, at one point i would have said that's true but i don't think that's true i think there's a lot of younger gamers but i don't think they play in historicals and so i think in order to get them into historicals you need stuff like aurelian you need to be able to say okay here you go you print it out you get it and you go plus in this day and age people aren't buying books People don't have space for them. They're downsizing. They're trying to simplify. And with the ability to have a thing like an iPad or a Kindle or any of those other tablets and and mobile devices, smart devices, I mean, you get the rules. I could look at the rules on my iPhone for crying out loud. And I I, I don't want to because this is a small screen, but I could. And you get the PDF and you look at it and you do whatever. So in this digital age, I, I really think that game designers and a lot of them now the bigger ones anyway are offering you know digital version of the rules but i really think they need to fully embrace it and sam has done that so i think between all those aspects of it being a pdf make it a no-brainer for anyone to pick up if you're at all curious about ancients gaming because Mm -hmm. The PDF's there, so you have all the accessibility stuff for it, the accessibility and ease of play, plus the cost and everything. That's a huge, huge pro for it. And I I think even if it was a terrible game or or even if there were all these negatives about it, I think you still couldn't beat that gigantic pro. I think you still have to say it's a win and something that people have to pick up because that's it's huge. It's so huge. I, I, I'm going to say huge again, which I never would do. It's huge. That Huge. It, yes, it's huge. It has all this. We lost half our listeners. Uh, it, it has all this about it, and it is such a benefit. Yeah. It is so good. And also, it would make a good gift for someone. And not all of these games would make a good gift. And you might be thinking, it's a PDF. How is that going to be a good gift? So the gift is you buy them the PDF, right? And you could buy them the unit tiles and the action cards, the, the nice made ones, but you buy them this and then you cut the stuff out and you give it to them. And, and speaking of cutting out and giving, um, before we get to the cons, let's talk about terrain because it's kind of interesting in how you do terrain for this game. And um, uh, do you want to start or shall I? No, you go ahead. You've got all the stuff there. Yeah. Um, so the train, you print and play terrain. And yeah. You get everything from woods to um, rough ground, a bunch of rocks. You cut it out. I got to say some of them were more enjoyable to cut out than others. And some of them I just wanted to stab myself in the hand repeatedly because I was like, not again. Part of it was my fault. I cut out like 10 copies of everything. You get a rocky hill. But I like not only do you get it, and some of them are more simplified for the, um, the graphic on it. But he writes, rocky hill. 
what kind of terrain it is. So there is no worrying that you're in the middle of a game and you forgot. So what did we call that? Did we say that's difficult terrain? Did we say that's open? What did we say that as? And that's something I always forget about when we play. How do we class stuff? So you might notice, Adrian, that usually I avoid terrain when we play. Like I like to have it on the table, I like to look at it, but I usually don't go into it because I can't remember one, what, how we're treating it, and two, what roles affect it. So I usually avoid it, but says, oh, look, Gentle Hill obstructs shooting. Oh, okay, I'll go on the hill because I know it will obstruct shooting. And you print them out, so you get all of it, and you put it on the table. It's very, very old school, but it's nice. So you get everything. You give it to the person. You do whatever, and you get all that stuff. Oh, and there's streams, too. Um, it's kind of for me, if you're willing to head towards the cons, of things the trains also kind of a con for me because some of them I, I mean there's only so much you can do with print and play terrain that you don't assemble right i mean if it's 2d you got to have some sort of simplified aspect of it but like the streams first of all pain in the butt to cut out you can see i um if you watch a video i skipped like some of the inside curves they're just like it's so tight and so sharp it's hard to get that just right without like actually cutting into the stream and then also, like, I would have loved for, like, maybe it to be made more modular for streams, for example, so that you could cut it in places and then tape it together to create, like, bends and curves and stuff. Because in the scenario we played, the, what was it, Battle of Dura Europus, there's a stream here that does a 90-degree turn. I don't know a lot of streams that do that, but okay, that's fine. Yeah, but that, the thing with the streams is that that's by design. So, so that when you're laying the terrain out, like it's, it is, there's but, no question about where it goes. It falls along the grid lines of, of the map board that you set up. But this looks, this looks dumb on the table to me. If I saw this, I'd be like, really, this is how it looks. The stream, it forms a 90 degree angle. And maybe that's, I get it because you have the grid and stuff, but like you could, if, if, if this was designed in such a way so that you could kind of cut it say here, whatever, and then you can kind of make your own curve, which that's all I'm asking for. It, it, it would be fine, but it's so straight, even though it kind of like, it varies, it goes a little bit to the left, a little bit, it's straight, and like the ends are basically straight, so the only way to line it up is to do it straight to straight. And even if you cut, you really can't, you'd have yeah. to engineer something. So like, I was a little disappointed with the streams um, for that. Uh, you talked a little bit about one of your big pet peeves, one of your cons, the Aureus. Now, why does oh. that annoy you so much? Because, <laughs> like, you go off about it. It yes, it's a Roman gold coin. I get it, and but like, it adds flavor. That's what it does. It adds. It helps you put, be in the setting. It, it's trying too hard. I think that's why it annoys me. Okay, <laughs> sort of like me, Doc. Inky protests too much. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. I mean, I, I get that. And, and I don't. That's I that hardly. That hardly qualifies as a con, but yeah, I'll just no, I'll but just you won't shut D up about it. I'll just roll a d6 and divide it by three. Thanks. I mean, I'll print out an Aureus for you, I guess, or we could you use see, one of these tokens and we'd just be like, hey, look, how'd see, it go? Oh, wait, it's we don't know what it is, what, so that means see what you're doing now. Yeah. That's why I won't shut up about it because <laughs> shut up about it. I, I, I just kind of like that it annoys you so much because it, it's so minor. Uh, and I can't, I think he did it for flavor. If that's my only guess. And I, I like that he did it. Uh, am I going to use one? I think if you're a person who looks at the rules and says, this is the only way we can do it, so I got to go find an original Aureus to do... I think, first of all, you have to reassess things. It's, you know, I, I, that's clearly not what he wants people to do because yeah. he doesn't want you to go rob a grave or steal an ancient artifact from a museum or, or buy something illegally. Obviously not. If you don't have a flipping spare die six laying around then you know flip a quarter but yeah or uh, you could flip a, a gold dollar coin yeah get back in um circulation now yeah so that, if you, that name, but yeah yeah i mean you you flip an american currency version of an aureus and you go uh what are some of the other cons for you uh, i know you must have some i really can't think of anything that i would particularly call a con i initially thought um playing with the unit tiles instead of miniatures would be a con i don't hate it as much as i thought i would and you can certainly play the game with miniatures uh but at this point i don't think we ever will i mean we're definitely gonna be playing it more 
Um, but I don't see the point of, of painting up armies for it. Um, the cards work out just fine. Um, Before we started everything, uh, you had read the rules because, I mean, that's one of the things you're really good at. You, you absorb and understand the rules. So, like, you're the rules guy uh, for us yeah. here in your recon. And you read it, and you were hesitant about play, even wanting to play. I it. was. I, I, I read through the rules the first time, and I was like, I don't freaking like this. And what I didn't like about it is the fact that there is no dice rolling. And this goes beyond the Aureus irritation. It's the reading the rules. It makes it sound like the, you know, the outcome of any combat that you get into that's going to be predetermined or whatever. And there's no, like, no, there's no chance that you're not going to know what's going to happen, if you know what I mean. Well, I, 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 just, think... I didn't, I didn't like that at all. In practice, um, it's not like that at all. You know, the card that you're going to play and you know, um, you know, what effects or in play, like, if, you know, if your unit is disrupted, you know, you're going to have to subtract one from your combat value, so on and so forth. But there's enough randomness that the outcomes are definitely not predetermined the way I was afraid they were going to be. Shooting is a different story. Shooting, you can almost guarantee that you're going to do damage. Uh, combat, melee combat, that's not the case at all. Yeah, because the way you explained it to me was, like, if you have a unit, and it's attacking, and it has an Elon of five, and your opponent has... Let me pick a different card. <laughs> Has an Elon of four, you know you need to play a, a one to win. And you're like, and that's that. And then game over. And I was like, there has to be more to it than that. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, it turns out there is. And I think even though that's not a con about the actual gameplay of it, I think you have to say it's a con on the rules. It's, it's a negative with the rules. And that how they're written... Oh yeah, all I can it, say is it gives that impression because, like, I think yeah. any set of rules, and I think many of them fall victim to this, but I think any set of rules should be something where you can pick it up, you can read it, and in your head you can figure out this is how it's going to play, and that when you then play it, it holds true, yeah. so that it makes sense, it's logical, it's it's easy to follow and understand. It's not overly complicated to determine what's supposed to happen. I think a lot of rules fall victim to that. I think a lot of them play completely differently than they're written, which it doesn't make sense to me that they would be like that. Because like if the rule says you do this X, Y, and Z, and this first, and then this and this, then that's what should happen in the game when reality for a lot of things, they're not. And I don't know if that's a case of um, rules in general need clearer writing or they're not play tested enough, or I'm not quite sure what it is. And I think this is a really good set of rules. But the fact that that was there for you, that you had that moment, I think that's something that maybe needs to be reassessed with the rules. And I don't think he will ever reassess these rules. I'm not suggesting that he he, he is. I, I think it was like, I want to do this and I'm done. And we Yeah, I mean, yeah, but, it's other people reading it may not have had the reaction I did. I mean, maybe they would have been able to see if there was enough variance. I think Alex had that same experience, though. Did he? And I think that was one of the reasons. I think he was like, I, I don't want to play. Yeah, because and I mean, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but like you, I, I really got the feeling from you that you're like, I'm not playing. And I know that I thought I had to do whatever I can to force Adrian to play because we're playing this because one, I want to and two, we have to But like we're going to play. And how can I get him to play? <laughs> and I really thought you're going to be like, no, just no. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> I was very happy when uh, you were like, OK, fine, we're going to play a and you weren't looking forward to it. You, you, I think you dreaded it and you got me thinking like, maybe it's not going to be good. Like, did I mess up? And like, how are we going to handle this? It, Cause like, I don't want to like say bad things about it. Cause yeah. like, that's not what we do, but like, I don't want to lie. And it turned out we were both wrong. We played it. We love it. We want to play yeah. more of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I don't, I don't have the problem that you do. If it sucked, I'd say it sucks, but uh, it doesn't, <laughs> but um, it's yeah. Like I said, it, it's a very enjoyable game. We'll definitely be playing it more. Um, but yeah, my first read through the rules, it was like, ah, geez, I don't know. It just doesn't sound good. And then when I read them a second time, because, you know, a little bit of time had elapsed between the first read through and the time we we're actually going to play, it was a little bit better. And I was like, all right, you know, we'll give this, sh give it a shot, see how it goes. And uh, that's fine. So if you get that impression, if you buy the rules and read through them and get the impression that, it's not going to be very much fun. It's not going to be very random. It's not going to be 
that everything is going to be predetermined. Um, it's it doesn't play the way it reads. I, I think what you're trying to say is that people should pretend they're holding the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and just read the front of it. Don't don't panic. Yeah, yeah. It'll it'll be okay. It'll be fine. No, no. It's it, yeah. It's it definitely is fine. Um, I still prefer rolling dice to laying cards, but that's you know that's just the game. But I I think you're right though that um we are gonna play more of it, and I agree with you. I love to roll dice because I'm someone. You gave me like fifty dice. I'm like, yes, I got fifty dice. I gotta roll them all. Uh, yeah, it's. I I really dislike dice towers because I I need to hold them in my hand and I need to be like and and yeah. roll those things, but it doesn't bother me at all about like I like that I don't have to roll dice I can actually concentrate on not worrying what do I need to roll to win or whatever I can concentrate on the actual mechanics of yeah. where do I want my forces to go kind it was kind of like when we played Carnage and Glory it made it feel more authentic to me yeah that it, was this feels more authentic like I'm actually. I was concerned about my units. Like, I don't want them to get hurt because yeah. like they get wives and kids in there and, and they get friends and stuff, but we got to do our thing. And whereas if I was rolling this, I'd be like, oh, come on, give me a six. Give me yeah. a two. Like, I don't care. And yeah, I don't, this I don't is going to give me that. Yeah. I don't know what it is about rolling the dice, but it, it you know, kind of gives you the feeling that you're like doing something, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, in Carnage and Glory, of course, you don't even get to lay the cards down. At least you get to make a choice and, uh, in Aurelian, but yeah, Carnage and Glory, it's just like whatever the computer says happens, happens. Which is nice for its own reasons, too. I mean, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is. So many different games and so many different styles of stuff, but it's nice in yeah. its own way. Uh, I, I do think moving forward, I agree with you, we are going to play more of it. I think we're going to play a lot more of it, maybe more than you even realize we're going to play. Uh, but I think we're not going to necessarily do one offs. I, I think we need to do a campaign. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I want to give the campaign rules a try, and maybe that could be a short review in and of itself at some point. But because um, that we didn't, I didn't even, be honest, I didn't even read the campaign rules because I knew we weren't going to do that. Yeah. And I mean, I think a lot of people won't. I, I think this is geared where you can just do pickup games because we didn't even talk about it, but like they have point values on the stuff. And also, I think it's geared where people might do tournaments yeah. uh, of it. Uh, so you have that kind of aspect and they might never touch the campaign stuff. Yeah. Um, usually, if I look at a set of rules, I ignore campaign things because I know there's not usually enough time for it. And even if there was, like, they fall apart. It's like trying to do a D&D campaign. Yeah, uh, exactly. You get it set up and you start playing and then, like, three sessions in, someone can't come and then someone else can't come, like, four sessions down the road and then it's over. So, like, yeah. a campaign is usually doomed to fail. But I think this is, from what I understand, how it's done, which isn't, I don't understand a whole lot because I get to spend more time reading it. But from what I understand, I think it's done in such a way that makes it manageable, makes it accessible, that where it keeps popping up tonight. And I also think it makes it fun and easy to do so that it's not too long. Uh, so I can see us. Uh, I really can see us doing that. Yeah. Why don't we move on to my favorite section of the show, mailbag. So from Facebook, we have a little piece of feedback from listener Julie regarding episode 187, huzzah, 2017. Quote, great podcast, Jonathan, Mike, and Joshua. You really... I'm actually wrong. That's not Huzzah. That was the main historical war gamers episode. Um, as I correct myself on the fly. Um, but she says, you really pinpointed so oh, here we go. Uh cut it off. Sorry. You really pinpointed some stuff because I'm a pro. We're professionals here at Wargaming Recon. <laughs> Longest running tabletop wargaming podcast <laughs> on the in existence. So let's start that again. And I know that Joshua will go back and edit that so it's seamless for people who are listening to the audio and that'll just pick up here. So listener Julie said of episode 180, whatever it is, uh, Main Historical Wargamers Association, episode 187, I believe. Great podcast, Jonathan, Mike, and Joshua. You really pinpointed some stuff that will help us grow the club and huzzah and the hobby. Thank you. So first of all, Julie, thank you for leaving your feedback and I am so happy that you liked that episode. I think the MHWA episode was really good. And Adrian, I'm sorry you weren't able to be there with us, but uh, hopefully you've listened to it and that you've enjoyed it as well. I have not listened to it yet, actually. No, see, that's when you lie and you say, of course I've listened to it. And it was a joy to listen to it. And everyone else should listen to it as well. It was a great episode. And everyone who hasn't listened to it yet should also, they should do, in fact, they should cut off from this and go listen to episode 187 right now. Just switch and go over. Um, and then also, listener Mike said of the same episode, you were like the canvas 
uh, that the, she's talking about me actually. Uh, you will like the canvas that the others can create on. Without your rock solid foundation, it becomes difficult to focus. I know having been a guest on your show, it makes all the difference in the world, unquote. So Mike, thank you very much for your kind words. They are really, really nice. And I, Mike, I believe was kind of referring to my role here in the show. We've talked about it a little bit in the past, not to make it about us because it's about the content, but like, Adrian, you do the rules and uh, at conventions uh, with the painting and all that, that kind of stuff. It's like, well, what do I do? And this is part of what I what I do. So there's value. And it's nice to know that people appreciate it and uh, can see what's going on here. Um, we also have a, a new review on iTunes, which is kind of interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah, that doesn't happen often. So we have a five-star review titled Top Notch from Landon Celano of the Grunt Work Podcast. Quote, really impressed with the quality of the content and how enjoyable it was even being semi-unfamiliar with the topic. Unique perspective. Can't wait to consume all there is to listen to. So Landon Celano, thank you very much for your very kind five-star review on iTunes. And you too can leave us a review on iTunes and you can think, why the heck am I going to do that? And Adrian, I'm sure you're thinking like, why am I going to take time out of my life to leave a review? And the reason is it helps other people find the show. So if someone goes and, they, and they're using their smartphone and they see in the iTunes directory, if that's how you uh, listen to the show, they see that there's Wargaming Recon and there's some other Wargaming podcast. They're like, which one am I going to subscribe to? Which one am I going to listen to? Well, I don't know about you, but I would look at the one that has all the really good five-star reviews, Wargaming Recon, and think, I'm going to give them a try before the other one. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it, it just kind of makes a difference. And uh, we have some announcements so i want to let everyone know some excited news and this might be new to you as well adrian that according to the nerd broadcasting network the roku channel is just weeks away from going live uh at least as of the moment that we're recording this here in the middle of july 2017 so when that happens we will share the information with you so that you will know how to access all the video content that we are releasing because we've talked about in the past earlier this 2017 season that we're doing video content that will be appearing on a Roku channel. We have the flagship Wargaming show there. So there'll be all sorts of different types of video content and you'll be able to get it there. And eventually it'll be not only on the Roku channel, but it'll be on Amazon fire. It'll be on Apple TV, Google play and all sorts of other places. So we're really excited that the Roku channel is coming out. And you'll be able to watch, and which just kind of blows my mind that people are going to be watching us, um, watch us on your TV and, and see stuff. And you'll even be able to get the video from the audio podcast on there. And I think yeah. eventually they're going to have it set up so that the audio can be put into there as well. Because they're, I, I like some old time radio dramas like Sherlock Holmes and that kind of stuff, yeah. The Shadow. And there's an old time radio Roku app. Oh. And so, you you listen to old time radio on your TV, which is kind of weird, but people listen to music on their TV. True. So you can just go and do, and you get it. So I think eventually down the road, you'll also be able to just be like, I want to listen to Wargaming Recon episode 188 because it looks cool that they're going to review Aurelian and you'll be able to get the TV to play it for you without having to watch us talk because that might be distracting. And weird. Yeah, I mean, for some people, my yeah. two-year-old loves to watch us though because she's always like, like she loves YouTube and whenever she'll see my face show up, she'll be like, Dada, watch. And so we got to watch like episodes of Working Recon, which she has no idea what we're talking about, but she's just really excited to see my face. And, and like she's met you, Adrian. So she's like, she knows your face and she'll be like, hmm. <laughs> and so she'll sit there and watch us for <laughs> hours. And I'm like, you're two and you're watching. We're family friendly, but like it's weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of is. It's like a cat. My cat was watching. My wife was playing like she had this loop of like birds playing on a bird feeder, and she was playing that on her uh, on her computer downstairs. And one of the cats was just sitting there with its paws up on the computer, nose to the screen, watching. These. So it's just like that. She's like a cat. Exactly. Well, she meows sometimes. You say, "What sound does a kitty cat make?" And she goes, "Meow." And, and so, I mean, the cat will go meow too, right? Yeah. They chase balls and they're nice to cuddle with. And so, I mean, it's pretty similar. 
Uh, we should take a moment, though, to thank our Patreon backers, Patrick, Chris Parker from DaveBattleGames.com, and Kyle from Vermont. We're about halfway to meeting our next goal, which will allow us to pay Joshua, who I mentioned earlier, as an audio editor. He's kind of editing the audio to be nice for us for right now, but we actually need to pay him because audio editing is a pain in the butt. And, you know, when you hire someone, you're supposed to pay them for the work that they do. So meeting the goal will allow us to pay him because he's been really nice, but like we need to pay the guy. Yeah, because I certainly wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't getting paid. No, of course not. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. (laughs) (laughs) So we're about halfway there. And if you're not a backer and you want to become one, just go to the show notes. That's right. WargamingRecon.com slash WR188. There'll be a link. And if you become a backer, you get episodes before non-backers. It costs as little as $1 a month. That's right. A dollar a month. It will get you in. And then you also get behind the scenes content. And there's other pledge levels. So you can get things like Wargaming Recon Dice, which are really cool. They're very popular. We do um, bumper stickers and you can get shout outs on the show and all the kind of stuff. So you can do all of those things. And then we're on Facebook and you can email us and on Twitter and all that's in the show notes. Wargamingrecon.com slash WR188. That's right. WorkingRecon.com slash WR188. So, Adrian, before we close out the episode, any fun or exciting or interesting things you want to add? No. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> well, I have to thank Mr. Sam Mustafa for allowing us to have review access to Aurelian, not only because it's something I really wanted to do and it's such a great game, but because... It's allowed you and I to do something that we never get to do, which is to game during the week. That just, it doesn't happen. No, very so, rarely anyway. I, 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 way back on the show, you used to have a section where I would talk about like my week in gaming or my month in gaming, however long. And then I stopped doing it because I was like, for a gaming show, I don't get to play games very often. <laughs> yeah. So it was, just, it was embarrassing to be like, well, I saw a movie that influenced me for a game that I would like to play someday <laughs> so i stopped it but like we played a game darn it oh my god it was good so thank you sam thank you very much uh, that's what i have to say about that all right well everyone um be sure to check out the show notes as i had mentioned not only for all the other stuff but because we have an episode guide in there and the episode guide tells you what new stuff is coming up so for example you'll be able to learn that the next episode 189 comes out on august 7th 2017 and that we have a very full full rest of the year coming up so that uh episode 189 you and i are reviewing some wargamish terrain stuff they are new hedges Uh. and then end of august mike Payne and i are going to be talking about the open gaming convention 2017 and then we go into september which is going to be a great month because you and i are going to do our hobby bunker game day 2017 episode and you and i are also doing the interview with sam mustafa who created Aurelian and all the other games we talked about, well, almost all the other ones we talked about. And then there's like other events that we're going to have episodes for. We've got Console of Five Nations. We're going to be talking about this Extra Life 24 Hour Gamerthon, the Holiday Gift Guide, Carnage, and eventually our 2017 season ends. And I'm already planning tw- 2018, which is kind of crazy because it's the middle of the summer here right now when we're recording this. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a lot to do. That's fine. No, it, I mean, it's all good. It keeps us busy and it keeps people interested in what's going on. And of course, it's not just what we're doing for the podcast, but we get a lot of video content we're working on. Actual play videos and yep. uh, how-tos and tutorials and videos from events and all that kind of stuff. So like, we're legit. We're a real thing. There's a lot of us working on this. There actually is when you think about it. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of surprising. Did you see this happening when you started the channel? You know, what nah. we need to do, um, and maybe we should do it for end of October, episode 195, we should do an origin story uh, episode again, a little navel gazing to talk about um, not only mine, but also your expectations from when you came on and when you first started hearing me talk about the podcast, because yeah. you heard me talk about it way before we even... Oh, yeah. long And long before, I, you know, when we first met, we were... In fact, I think the first game we played together was Agricola. Yeah. With uh with Carrie. 
And I think you had mentioned it then. I was, yeah, I was like, I got a podcast, and I'm sure you guys were like, yeah, nobody cares. Just be quiet and play the that game. That was exactly my reaction. It's like, I've known you for an hour, and I do not give the slightest crap about your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would believe it. So we should do an episode about that. Um, yeah. Short answer, I hoped it would be. Back then, my hope was, and who knows that it would ever become a such a thing, but my hope was that this could be my job. Yeah. And, and pull like a, a beast of war kind of thing where like, this is what I do. And yeah, that would be pretty awesome. Whether it was just me or like a team of us or whatever, but that would do this yeah. and be able to like go to places and cover things and actually like have actual like real professional equipment, whatever that meant, whether yeah. it was like microphones or, or like video, like whatever it was. In like, I didn't know what it was, but whatever it was, I think that's what it, I was like. And I was like, it'd just be cool to like, go to Historicon or Gen Con or whatever and be like, they know who we are. And, and like, we get in as like official press and like, we're doing a thing and we're respected and we're like everywhere and people love what we do. And well, I think I've, that's kind of what I want. I've asked you more than once to go to Historicon. We need to go and do a Historicon or possibly fall in. That one's an easier one to get to. Well, as but, I had told you, that's not off the table, but I think whenever we do it, I think that's going to be the only con we can do for that entire year. Well, that would be too bad, but okay. It, it, but it's expensive. I mean, driving down, getting all the way down there, and then cost of hotel, and I'm sure it's not cheap to get in. And I, I know Historicon's wonderful, but Historicon doesn't know us, right? So, like, we don't get press access for stuff. Or maybe we would, I don't know. Uh, but, like, that means yeah. it costs more. So <laughs> when you don't get press or review access to stuff, things, the prices go up exponentially. It, it, it makes it harder to cover everything. Yeah, I guess. All but right. Anyway, it, it's something to be on the list, so people can uh, look forward to that. I'm gonna mental note, which means I'll forget in two seconds. But mental note for listeners: hopefully, episode 195 will be our navel gazing episode. But you'll find out on the episode guide, which of course you get to by going to the show notes, wargamingrecon.com slash wr 188. Because I had to get that in there one more time. They say you got to repeat things so that you say things three times and then people remember. So I try to give you the wonderful listener show notes three times. So that way you go there because the show notes has everything. They are just fantastic. Well, Adrian, thank you very much for joining this You're episode and being co-host and for playing the games and all the wonderful things. I I honestly, I can't wait to play Aurelian again because I've been dreaming about it. I'm like, so... What are we going to do next? Like, we should come up with a scenario and, like, try to do something cool. And I get a problem. I get an Aurelian problem. Yeah, we should come up with a scenario. I'll tell you what, how about you come up with a scenario? Hey, I will. Play? All right. The, I, no guarantee it's going to be good or anything, but I will absolutely do such a thing. Uh, the guarantee is actually probably in the opposite direction, but, yeah, we can give it a shot. Yeah, sure. I mean, it'll be terrible, maybe, but it'll be my terrible, which means it'll be <laughs> enjoyable. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of Wargaming Recon. As always, you know, no matter how many barbarians you are fighting away or trying to civilize or how many problems you have with the poor sanitation in your beautiful city of Rome at the turn of the century, you know that you have to, you gotta, you need to keep on gaming. <laughs>